We know that truly helpful service, people you can depend on, and sound financial advice isn't easy to come by. But at Envision Bank, you can rely on us. Rely on us to be there when you need us most, to help guide your financial future. And while we often think we're at the end of something, we're at the beginning of something else. Rely on us for a better tomorrow. Together, a brighter future is in sight. Envision Bank, see the difference. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to our amazing financial uh, panel um, where we're gonna be asking and answering some pressing pandemic related uh, financial questions that I think a lot of people hopefully um, have during the pandemic, not hopefully have, but hopefully can get answered, I guess, during the pandemic um, with two really wonderful experts. Um, we have certified financial planner and certified financial coach and sorry, life coach. So a life coach and a financial planner, which is basically like the perfect combination, I think, of um, money help and life help and money and emotion come into play so much and together. And Misty Lynch from Beck Bode uh, in Dedham is with us and she combines both of those skill sets. So she's going to be answering some questions about money management, but also how that plays into our emotions um, and our life, especially during such a stressful time. And then we have Gerald Lofton with us as well. Uh, and he is a certified financial planner with Proficient Wealth Counselors in Norwood. And he's gonna be answering some questions with us as well. And I think both of you guys could probably take yourself off mute and off of um, into the video to say hi. Hi, Kara. Hi, everybody. Hi, Kara. Um, hello. And also, of course, um, this is presented with Envision Bank, and we have Richard Olson with us as well uh, to sort of kick things off. Thank you, Kara, and hello, everyone. Uh, Envision Bank is really pleased to be part of today's important discussion. Uh, you know, in these times of uncertainty, it's really become easy for all of us to second guess every decision we make. You know, many people over the last year have felt the real impact of an uncertain economy of job loss or having to scale back hours while they're focused on helping their children figure out that brave new world of remote learning. These worries for many of us as, as parents uh, can be paralyzing and leaving us, frankly, like we'd rather feel like we want to stick our head in the sand than proactively address the needed changes to our financial plans. You know, my colleagues at Envision Bank see it every day with our customers. They're asking the same questions that today's panelists will help all of us address. You know, questions like, how much do I have to save for an emergency fund? Will I have enough to live off of in retirement? What would I do if I lost my job? Or how am I going to pay off debt? Or am I going to be able to get my kids through school? You know, well, there are so many things that we can't control. You know, my mother always taught me, focus on the things I can. Uh, and in doing so, they really say that you should have a plan that you look at and set goals on at least once a year. Well, certainly after the year we've had, it is the perfect time for all of us to be attending today's informative webinar. It's really a chance for us and, and frankly me personally to pause and evaluate any changes that we need to make. Um, if your financial plan is well established, like many people's are, then it's the perfect opportunity to review it with your investment advisor. Or as we hear so often from some of our customers, if you don't have an advisor or a long-term plan yet, maybe you can start with simpler goals like establishing that emergency fund. That's what makes professionals like Misty and Gerald and our team at Envision Bank uh, so good at helping design financial plans for clients to meet both long-term objectives while giving them an opportunity to put in short-term recommendations that we can all start tomorrow or next week. And, you know, I know when you come to these things, you think to yourself, oh, I can't plan, I don't make enough money to save, or I have too much debt, right? We've all been there. Um, years ago, I read this book called The Wealthy Barber, and the headline that I took away from it was, pay yourself first, meaning before you start thinking about bills and everything else at the start of a, a week or a budget cycle, think about a reasonable amount of money that you can set aside in a reserve account. Um, the book's author told me then it should be 10% of my net pay. And I thought, oh, I can't do that. I mean, I was much more worried about, you know, money to go out on a Friday night back then. So I started with $20 a week back then. And it, over time, I grew it. And that's how my plan started. 
So I know our panelists will offer you much smarter strategies than that little tip from me, uh, but it worked for me as a much younger version. With the real point being though, and one that we share with every customer we discuss their goals with is this, we all have to start sometime. So why not make today the day we do? And so with that, I'm really looking forward to hearing from our panelists thoughts on how to help others endure during these trying times and best prepare for the future. So thank you, Cara, and thank you, Misty and Gerald. Thank you so much, uh, Richard. And again, my name is Cara Baskin. I am a lifestyle parenting uh, writer for the Boston Globe, as well as covering food. So it is a pleasure to be with all of you. And I think that let's just situate ourselves first in terms of things that every single person, to Richard's point, should have in place right now. Um, some basic financial principles, basic financial strategies that anybody can do regardless of income. So I don't know if that means an emergency fund, if that means life insurance or health insurance, but um, Misty and Gerald, uh, let's start with you, Misty. What are some things that you think that everybody should have in place starting now? Sure, I think that you know there's definitely um, a need for everyone to have some sort of an emergency fund. I know that that's something that's very hard to hear right now, especially if you're struggling to pay your bills, but I think it is something that most people, even if you have to start slowly building, is something that you can, or else everything is gonna turn into an emergency. Maybe then you're gonna have, you won't be able to pay down credit card debt because everything will have to go on the card. If there's nothing there um, for those things that happen outside of the normal expenses you, you know, can plan for, it's good to have a little cushion there. Um, and then I think it's really important for people to look at, especially nowadays, to look at if they have any estate planning done. Um, if you're single, if you need somebody to have a healthcare proxy for you or a power of attorney to step in and make decisions, if you did have a health emergency or something like that, that could be something that you could take care of inexpensively, or you might even be able to do that online you know, with the state to make sure that there's some plan in place if you need help and if you have children, very important to make sure that those things are taken care of. If something was to happen to you, to your spouse, your partner, um, to make sure that the state's not making the decisions for them and that it's actually your decision is in place. I think those are two things that people really should start looking at if they haven't addressed it. Okay, Gerald, anything else to, to add? I know that you have a lot of expertise, especially when it comes to health related things. We've talked about this before um, with people, especially having perhaps higher healthcare costs these days. So what should they make sure to have? Absolutely. So one of the first things that I would recommend is, is looking to see if your employer offers any type of health savings account, mm. flexible spending account. It's a great way in which individuals can defer money um, on a pre-tax basis and use those funds for health related matters should they come up. Uh, the, the beauty of those type of accounts is that they actually become kind of, I would say, an alternative to a nice way of putting money away tax deferred, which can actually be used almost like an IRA. Uh, but the nice thing about those is that you can take funds out without taxation so long as you're using them for health related costs. So that would be something that I would definitely consider uh, on the health side. Uh, in addition to that, you know, I can't agree more with Misty when she says, just making sure you have sufficient funds for an emergency fund. Um, anywhere from nine to 12 months of savings is definitely adequate. Uh, because you never know when that rainy day may happen, whereby you have to tap, tap those funds. Do you have a suggestion, either of you, about where to stash that money, where it can get the most interest, where you could also have easy access to it if you do need it in an emergency? Where do you actually save that money? So my emergency fund is in a savings account. It's in an online high yield savings account. There might be some at banks, yeah, your bank if you bank with Envision, if you bank anywhere. Mine is not attached to my savings and checking. It's one step away because okay. if it's too accessible, the emergency might be that I'm at Target and my kid really wants something and they're waving it in my What's face. Emergency, <laughs> emergency like to, to make you stop. So yeah. I think it's important that it's really kind of accessible within 24 hours, 48 hours, but a little bit more out of sight, out of mind. So you almost can just either automatically fund it, you maybe you push $20 into there while you're starting once a week, or when you get paid, you just move money over there and um, have control over it. But I think you want to keep it like a separate thing and have a one tiny hurdle, even if it's going and logging into a different place and doing a transfer to get to it. So don't link it to your checking account. 
is what you can if you're very good. But if you have some problems with overspending, or maybe you always look at that money and just see it there and feel like it should be doing something else, that's not its point. It's not your right. investment. That's not the money that's working for you. That's there for like, that is for when you actually do have those emergencies. So that's where I keep mine. Okay. Well, you know, on that note, and this is something that I bet a lot of us are feeling right now where, you know, you know, in theory, you are supposed to save for a rainy day, but there are so many competing priorities. Um, what if you have credit card debt? What if you also feel that you need to be saving for retirement in a 401k? Um, do you suggest that the emergency fund is the first thing you do before paying down any debt? Um, how do you reconcile those? Um, should you just shave off like $20 every week? Like, like Richard did back in the day. What is your strategy if you have a lot of different competing priorities, Gerald? Absolutely. I, I would first start by emphasizing the fact of having the emergency fund. Uh, naturally, when you go through the planning process, you, you always want to start with the budget and a realistic budget. Yeah. Um, it's one thing to have a budget. It's another thing to have a realistic budget identifying your fixed expenses and then your variable expenses. We all understand that many of us, we have expenses, everything from mortgage to rent payments, car payments, insurance, utilities, grocery bills. That's before we even put money on ourselves. But one of the things that I learned many years ago is the biggest, biggest expense that you'll have is yourself. So it definitely makes sense to put money away for yourself. So even if that, as Richard had mentioned, is $20 per pay period, I would start there. Ideally, we talk about, and at least from a professional perspective, you know, anywhere from nine to 12 months of emergency savings. That may be difficult for most people, but if you're able to start, you're certainly going to be better off than not starting at all. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about, and this is a question that came from the audience. And I have to say, we got a bunch of really good, very targeted audience questions. I tried to pick and choose some of the ones that were very common and a little more general. What percent of a person's wealth should be kept in cash or similar, especially these days where maybe the stock market's a little scary? Um, what do you think? Does that vary based on income or do you have sort of a flat percentage that you would advise? So I don't necessarily, I know that I've seen percentages that say, you know, 30% for this, 20% here. I do think that it is a little bit different by, um, by individual. I okay. tend to have, um, I do have that, you know, six months kind of sitting in cash in case I need it. Um, it's grown a little bit, you know, trying to stretch that out just in case, you know, things change with employment. So now my husband and I are both employed still. We're both doing okay. Our yeah. lives have changed a bit, but we have that potential. We cannot go anywhere or do any vacation. So we've right. been able to actually make sure that that's um, in a good spot, just in case one of us did have to reinvent our career or, or go through a different period of, of unemployment or something, something comes up that's big. Well, but I do think that people, some people spend a lot more than others. Some people are, have all of their bills under control and have no debt. They might be able to invest a little bit more. Right. Um, or they might be able to, you know, be comfortable at a, at a certain level of cash. So I think it's really important to know what makes you feel okay. And if you say, I don't feel good unless I can see at least $10,000 in cash or at least a thousand or some, or some people it might be far more than that. Mm -hmm. That's going to allow you to work and, and do the things you need to do. Yeah. That is okay. That could be part of your plan. There's certainly there's a lot of rules out there, but I think people feel differently. And if they don't feel comfortable, they might start making rash decisions. So it's yeah. really important to know what feels good for you, what gets everything covered, and then try to build those muscles if investing is new, or if you're trying to pay down debt systematically and just kind of keep going with those new habits. So on the topic of investing, because this is a big question too, and Gerald, maybe you can weigh in here. We've had a crazy year. It has been, you know, and even before that, for the past four years or so, um, you know, people have been, we've been seeing the stock market react to perhaps a tweet. Um, the news cycle has been um, constant and never ending and unremitting. What do you think about the volatility of the stock market at this juncture? Um, is it okay to invest? Um, <laughs> and nobody has a crystal ball, but I think a lot of people might be skittish. So what is your take on that? You're absolutely. It's a, it's a common question, one that I probably hear at least once a day. Um, yeah, I figured. <laughs> the, the reality is that when you look at the financial market, certainly 2020 
for so many reasons was a year like no other. And when we apply that to the financial markets, we saw a substantial drop in uh, the value of the S&P 500, as well as the Dow Jones Industrial Average, mm. uh, to the tune of almost 30% uh, by the end of March. And markets literally, I would say, propelled forward for the final three quarters, whereby we saw double digit returns among those indices. Uh, so for certainly for someone who actually was very concerned and they put their money in a cash position, they missed out on the appreciation and unfortunately locked in a lot of those gains at the end of first quarter. You know, that's, that's a great an example of why goal-based planning makes a lot of sense, particularly when you're doing your investment strategies. Uh, if you have time on your side, if you can tolerate the risk, if you have a, a fairly good asset allocation strategy, uh, when we go through market events, you can then go back to what is my goal? Is my goal short term? Do I need these assets now? Or do I need these assets 10, 15, 20 years down the road? Uh, one of the things that uh, Misty had mentioned is certainly uh, even when it comes to uh, just being subjective and where you're putting your money in terms of uh, cash-based assets, the investment process also is subjective because no one investor is the same and therefore we're all unique. So we all have different goals. We all have different risk tolerances and hopefully we're able to build a portfolio that can withstand the volatility of the financial markets. So to put a finer point on that, for people watching who might need to do a little bit of financial planning cleanup, is it as simple as calling up a financial planner like you or like Missy and saying, you know, my short term goal is to buy a house, my medium term goal is to save for college, and my long term goal is to retire at 65. Is that what you mean by that sort of plan? Is that what, what a financial planner would ask and then how they would advise you to allocate correspondingly? Yeah, I think that's what I'm hearing from a lot of my clients is I have these all these goals, all these things that I want to do, um, okay. but they're not exactly sure like the order to do them in or if they can do them all at the same time. And typically, yes, you can do you can have multiple goals going on at the same time. And I think it's important, you know, we at our firm, we as invest in stock portfolios or do financial plans. And so for people who are nervous about the market or they think their volatility what I like for my clients is I know that their long-term money is where it should be. And typically that is in the stock market. And so I can act like they're their flight attendant when there is the volatility in the market and they are watching the markets halt and they're seeing things like happened in March and they call me and I'm perfectly calm. Then they can calm down. Right. Because if they lock in those losses, there's not much I can do. However, if they decide, okay, we are on this flight for a long time and you're fine, I'm okay. fine because I have, maybe I have money in cash flow right now, my right. money in my investments, I don't need for 15 years. The kids aren't going to college for another 10 years. We can get through this. That's really where I think we provide the most value is because you're going to want to react when it feels like something is happening and you should do something, right, right, but right. it's not necessarily the right time. So you're flying to Australia, not New York. <laughs> Exactly. Okay. Um, on that note, you know, one thing that a lot of people have asked me, and I'm talking personally too, I found myself in this situation, the pandemic has curtailed certain activities for people. So I didn't send my kids to camp over the summer um, because it wasn't open. Uh, my younger one is not in daycare right now because, you know, pandemic, it's a little germy. It's always germy in daycare. It's especially germy during COVID. Um, so we've cut down on a lot of expenses and find them um, diverted to other things. What would you say to somebody who actually has found themselves with a surplus uh, of cash in this situation, maybe due to not spending money on tuition or camps or so forth? Um, how should you prioritize that savings? And I'm talking about savings that, you know, it isn't an astronomical amount, but it could be, you know, maybe it's a few thousand dollars a month that can make a really big difference in a family's budget. Uh, where do you put that? And either of you, whoever wants to jump in. So assuming you haven't seen a decrease in salary and making the assumption that you are living within, I would say, a, a budget uh, confine. I would definitely recommend sticking to it, regardless if you're finding yourself with surplus cash. The surplus can help build emergency funds. If you're not at that nine to 12 months, it can be allocated to future education costs. Uh, it can also be allocated to one's retirement needs. So there's certainly a lot of places where people can put this excess cash. 
Uh, the one thing that we do know is for some, it may be uh, a season of harvest, but it may not always stay a season of harvest. And there will be times whereby you might have to draw on that money. So just making good financial decisions with it and being disciplined is extremely important. Yeah, I agree. Like, and with my clients, I'll typically will have goals and it's almost like those are like destinations in the GPS. And when you get that surplus or you get something like that, that could be something that says like, oh, here's a shortcut. You can get here faster. We'll look at those goals and we'll see, okay, maybe we put this tax refund. Maybe we put this in this surplus, maybe this bonus that was going to go to a vacation that won't go to a vacation. We put that towards one of the goals to get us there a little bit faster, speeds up the process because you want to take advantage of those things. Maybe you have enough in cash and it doesn't need to go there. Maybe it can go somewhere else. So really knowing what those goals are is the first thing, getting really clear on that. And then you can, you can maybe get places faster. Um, on the other side of that, I think that obviously the pandemic has been so hard on other people. We were just talking about restaurant workers and small business owners downtown, places that just aren't seeing the foot traffic. Um, let's say you're in a situation where you're actually suffering from an income loss. Uh, maybe you have escalated healthcare costs. Maybe you're relying on credit cards more than you would. Um, how amenable do you think companies are and credit card companies and so forth to you know asking for a lower interest rate or asking for forbearance on a student? loan is now the time to ask for some help or you know what are some strategies there for people who might find themselves struggling with debt so so again going back to this budget and yep. making the assumption that you have this budget in play I, the first thing you might have to do is look at lifestyle adjustments as it pertains to the student loan as well as credit card issuers i think they get it and they understand that you know, it's a global pandemic. It's not unique just to the individual borrower. Uh, the issue that at least I'm finding is subject to what one's credit history has been, their repayment history. Mm -hmm. Some lenders are more willing to work with individuals than others. So you really have to assess your individual situation. Hopefully you've had a very good record with that issuer so that when you do come for them for a reprieve, you're willing to work with you as opposed to you going to them and you have a history of late payments or not making payments at all. Mm -hmm. And is it worth then, do you just call up your credit card company and explain the situation? What is sort of the mechanics of that or your student loans? What do you do? Yeah, I think getting on the phone is very important. It is not fun. It is unpleasant and you're going to try to talk yourself out of it. You're going to say, they're not going to do this for me anyway. Try. And I would start by, I would call, I would be prepared. I would um, let them know how long you've been working with them. Tell them how much you enjoy working with them or their service or their product or anything like that. And then explain the situation in a way you are talking typically to another human being and there may be things that they can do. There might be things that they can do to either change your rate. Perhaps they can move you back from a penalty rate to your normal rate if you were late on something and you explain your situation. Um, they might be able to reduce, you know, maybe if you're cable, you're thinking maybe it's time for me to get rid of this. Um, maybe you can actually like talk to somebody about the situation and see if they'll work with you. I think that these, these companies have teams ready to take these calls and they expect it. And so I think it's important to make a list, see what the rates are for the companies that you, the credit card companies, look at your loans, what bills maybe could be, um, you know, what do you have more flexibility on? which, you know, and kind of rank them in a way so you know which ones are the most important. Maybe there's some you can cut entirely for now and hopefully come back, you know? So I think it's, it's really just a matter of kind of getting very organized with things that are there mm -hmm. and some bills have to get paid. And, you know, you can, you know, you might have to pay your rent because all of the other bills don't matter if you have nowhere to live. So I think you have to prioritize those th things and then see who you can work with um, and, and really do try to make a case for yourself in the best light you can. Um, a question that came through from a reader, and I think that this sort of plays into that because you know there are certain priorities you have. You have to have somewhere to live. You have to have food to eat. Um, when should retirement slide? I mean, is that a non-negotiable? You always hear, you know, just save twenty percent of your income and put it in your a four hundred one k. Should you ever compromise on that? Um, what is your philosophy these days about saving for retirement, especially if you're younger and, you know, still paying rent, um, still paying down student loans, things like that? 
if you have the ability to allocate resources to retirement savings, I'm a big advocate of it. I do understand, as I had mentioned, individuals have housing expenses as well as other um, bills that actually they have to address. Uh, yet if you're able to allocate even a small portion of your earned income into a retirement plan, particularly if the employer offers any type of matching incentive, mm -hmm. want to at least allocate to get the benefit of the match. Um, it's free money, why not take it? Right. But more importantly, if you're a younger investor, just the time value of those assets growing on a tax deferred basis can reward you handsomely in time. Um, that being said, for others, they may not have the luxury. Uh, perhaps the current expenses are so large that they feel that they have to focus on that. And, and if that's the case, it's okay if you can't you know, put money into a retirement plan, um, so long as you're not in a position whereby you are never putting money into a retirement plan. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've seen, I would say, multiple scenarios whereby people can overfund, take advantage of employer yeah. matches, as well as you know, they're not in a position to put money into the plan right now, but we establish a goal whereby they have a set time frame that they are looking to allocate resources to that retirement plan. Um, this is actually something that an, another question that came in that somebody asked me, um, you know, the days of having a pension are often gone. Jobs don't come with pensions. Uh, as you get older, if your job doesn't offer a pension, if you are struggling with competing priorities, saving for college, paying a mortgage, paying off loans and so forth, what do people who do, do once you're maybe 10 years away from retirement and suddenly you realize, you know, I didn't start saving into a 401k when I was 25, maybe you started at 45. What, do you, what is your philosophy there? Is it ever too late? Are there any sort of ways to catch up? What's the... Yeah, I think... Um, it's important for that, that mindset that it's too late. I, I think that's the first thing that you would need to work on because honestly, you could live to 95. And so if you're 40 or 45 and saying, oh, it's too late for me, what you're leaving your option now up to um, hoping that either there's services available to you, someone to support you. I mean, you're leaving so much up to chance. So no, I've seen people, I've seen people change what they're doing in their 60s, improve their credit score, thinking of different ways that they could start saving, maybe taking advantage of the catch-up provisions that are available in retirement plans for people over 50. What I've seen it? people start different income streams at different ages, move, reduce their expenses, things what, like that. What's the catch-up provision? That's interesting. Yeah, so you can do additional, I believe it's an additional five or 6,000 uh, into um, over the 401k limit. Okay. Um, and then in the IRA, you can do another a thousand as well um, after 50 to help catch you up if you started later or you're trying to get to, to reach a certain target. So that's something that's available. Yeah. And you're going to want to look at other things like your earning potential. You might say, oh, it's too late for me. Maybe it's not. So I think that's a really important to say, like if I did want to retire at 60 or, or maybe I do have to work until I'm 70, what would I not mind doing? Right. And maybe I need to find it. It, it, that's a very uh, unique point you bring up, Misty. What I do find just working with a number of pre-retirees and people transitioning into retirement, re retirement's subjective for everyone. And you know, even for like the individual who might be 20, they're saying, hey, I don't want to be working when I'm 50. And then they get 50 years. <laughs> and if they're not in a position to retire, now they you know, are saying, well, maybe 60 or maybe 65. And, and the truth of the matter is what I have found for many people, if they truly enjoy what they love doing, uh, retirement may not be the traditional retirement. Maybe it's uh, working less hours, but doing the same thing. Uh, for others, it may be leaving one career, but now like you're in a position whereby you can financially afford to do something that you truly love. Um, and, and that being said, uh, retirement definitely can change as we continue to age and we go through life experiences. Um, but you know, certainly being able to make contributions to get you to a point whereby you now are in the driver's seat and you have the ability to make decisions on what retirement may look like for you is extremely important. 
someone just wrote in with a question, and this is a good one. Is 15% the rule of thumb when you're saving for retirement? Is there sort of a equation um, there? You know, sometimes you hear it's like three times your age, you know, you should, if you're 30, you should have 90,000 saved or something like that. Is there sort of a formula that either of you abide to? I see, I see those formulas and sometimes I think they make people feel worse about themselves than they need to. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> yes, Good maybe there. you should yeah. have three times your salary and then five times your salary. And that's typically if you plan to then draw down 4% for the rest of your life. So the math works. But I do think that there are some times where you could say, okay, I want to, you know, maybe the goal is to eventually max out your contribution, or you want to start out by taking advantage of the full match that your company offers. Or if you have an IRA or a Roth IRA, you want to get to the point where you might be able to max that out every year. That's a great goal. Your everything is going to look a bit different. I think, yeah, if you can do 10, 15%, then you're probably going to put yourself in a pretty good position. If that's something that you can consistently do, absolutely. If it's not something you've done or something you can't do, it does not mean you shouldn't start. Okay. And is that 10 to 15% if you're, um, if you have a spouse or a partner who you're in a household with, is it each of you saving 10 to 15 or is it 15% of your household income? Or is it- you know, like, When I hear the rule of thumb, it would be per individual if they're earning income. So if you have a dual income household, right, the person right. would be doing 15%. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the, the rule of thumb. The, although we have heard numbers, I, I was looking at uh, correspondence yeah. two days ago and, and it stated that at a certain age, you should have you know so much time to your salary. God, you see these and people panic and you're like, oh yes, man. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> So what I often share with, with clients, and, and sometimes it's great to dream, is I say, close your eyes and envision what you'd like to do that's going to make you happy. And think about that as you transition into retirement. What is it that you really want to do that's going to make you happy? Now you can start to add variables like numeric values to say, how much do I need to accumulate? to get to that point in life, whatever age that may be, whereby I can do the things that I want to enjoy. And, and that's where I would start, as opposed to looking at these charts that then freak you out. Right, well, one thing, a theme that I hear from both of you is kind of using money to achieve your dreams instead of instilling fear or shame or panic, mm -hmm. um, which is a good way to think about it. And on that note, you know, a lot of people in the pandemic who, you know, maybe they scaled back just simply because they wanted to, maybe they were laid off, and needed to move on, but have started their own income channels, whether working for themselves, consulting, and so on. Um, what about them? When you're outside of the infrastructure of a typical workplace that might have a 401k and health insurance and so on, do you have any advice for people who are suddenly finding themselves self-employed during the pandemic? Um, what should they have in place? Where should they be putting their money? Are there special places for self-employed people? What do you recommend? Yeah, and I think, you know, I grew up um, with parents who were self-employed. So people who are self-employed, I've seen what happens when you don't have an HR department telling you what to do right. <laughs> or where to invest. Yeah. It's very much you're on your own. And if you're very good at running a business that is not financially related, your investments may go into technology to improve your business. It might go into something completely different. You are not investing necessarily in you. Possibly you're investing in your brain, which is a good investment. If you're learning new skills that can get you paid, I'm here for that. That's wonderful. But you do need to save for yourself for retirement. There was never even unemployment for people until the pandemic for people who are self-employed. That wasn't even on the table. So you just had to struggle, which is why self-employed people should have a larger emergency fund, because that might be the difference between you going through a rough patch and having to go get a job, mm -hmm. you know, having your business, you know, stay in fact. So yeah, I think it's important to talk to a planner to make sure that you have certain things in place, like proper insurance coverage. Maybe you need disability because if you can't work, you don't get any, you're not paid at all. Um, and then investing. Yeah, you can look at different options like SEP IRAs, solo 401ks, things you could set up for yourself where you can save pretty significantly on your taxes in good income earning years. And you could save more than a person with just an IRA or just a 401k could. And so I think it's really important for those self-employed people to work with an accountant, work with a financial planner, get money invested for the future and take a profit for themselves and pay themselves like they were working for another company. 
Any other tips, Gerald, especially in terms of those, you know, health, disability, things like that? Um, that Absolutely. Well, on, <laughs> on the self-employed conversation, I always say kudos. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of benefit, but also perhaps lifestyle flexibility if you are self-employed. Right. Um, entity structure is always a concern. Um, maximizing tax benefits is always a concern. Mm -hmm. Certainly the retirement, the emergency is always a concern. I mean, generally what I would suggest is, you know, people fall in two camps. There are individuals out there who are able to do the planning quite well. And you know, I've seen it whereby you know, I've had meetings and I've actually said, hey, you're doing a great job. Keep doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, the majority of, I would say, individuals, they need, you know, assistance in, at times. And it may not be, I would say, throughout their entire life, but just someone who can actually, I would say, be the stewardess as, as Misty had suggested, just to give them tips. Uh, this is kind of what you might want to consider at this particular time. And, and now those type of individuals, I would suggest, you know, it makes sense to sit down with a professional, someone who's going to listen to you, someone who's going to understand specifically what you're looking to accomplish and someone who has some experience to actually share with you how to meet those goals. Let's take a question that, this is interesting, this just came in um, from one of our audience members and it's something that I think a lot of people might be wondering about, um, especially if you need an infusion of money. Is there a benefit to withdrawing small pension plans, 10,000 or less from previous jobs now that interest rates are very low to roll over into a Roth IRA or is it best to leave them be? So I guess, you know, is now the time to be making any changes or should we ride this out and see how things shake out? I would say, yeah, if you've got different pieces to the puzzle and there's money in different places, maybe something is sitting in a money market or something is earning very little interest and you're not really doing much of it. There could be an opportunity that, yeah, maybe something like a Roth IRA, maybe if you did pay taxes on that now and converted it, if you're in maybe a lower tax bracket than you ever planned to be, if maybe employment this year or your income was just low. You could look at taking advantage of doing something like that and making sure that now, if you have a strategy for all of your money to make sure that it's all working well and it's all part of it. It can be in different places and that's where um, sometimes with the financial planning, it helps. I'm looking at everything that's available, no matter where it is, whether I manage it, it's managed at work, if it's in this pension, that maybe is something that you wanna stay in because of the years you have vested or something like that. And just making sure that all of the things are working because um, yeah, you could have a lot of time to take advantage of growth and maybe that $10,000 that, you know, you just think is there and might forget about it. Maybe that could turn into 40, 50, 60,000. If you're waiting, you know, if you invest it properly for the next 20, 30 years, I think all of those pieces that are on the table need to become part of the financial plan. Okay. Uh, another pandemic related question, because right now we've seen historically low interest rates. Um, and I know I just refinanced my mortgage, um, just kind of, and I'm an amateur, I just knew that the interest rates look good and it seemed like the right thing to do. Um, and so we did it. But so do you recommend doing that right now? Um, is there ever a reason not to refinance? And if so, um, you know, should people consider maybe going from a 30 to a 15, a 30 to a 20, assuming all things are equal right now and nothing has changed in their income level? Um, is this the time to kind of take advantage of that? Gerald? Absolutely. We are looking at extremely low historically and uh, low mortgage rates. Um, having recently gone through that myself, and then literally six weeks later, the rates dropped by a half a percent. Uh -oh. And I say to myself, hey, had I just waited? Uh, but needless to say, I mean, if you're, if you're able to get rates in the twos, um, or even I would say high ones, now that I, what I'm seeing, uh, yeah. certainly take advantage of it if you're in a position to do so. Uh, so yes, uh, yes to definitely, I would say consider refinancing. Uh, my personal, I would say, rule of thumb is if you're able to shave that mortgage rate, maybe I would say anywhere from three quarters to 1%, you run the numbers. Because keep in mind, in many cases, there are costs to refinancing. So albeit you may be getting a lower interest rate, once you add the cost to it, it may not necessarily be beneficial, particularly if you're going to add uh, extra beyond your principal interest on a monthly basis. As far as the 15, 20, 30 year, 
again, that, that really depends on cash flow. Naturally, the shorter the loan repayment period, the higher your mortgage payment will actually be. Again, I, I would look at the analysis. Would it make sense for me to uh, refinance for a 15 year as opposed to going with the 30, but just adding extra payments to it when I have the discretionary income to do so? So, so there's a number of things you want to consider when you're actually refinancing, but absolutely thumbs up to refinancing now. We don't know where interest rates are going. Well, they could go to zero, and then we'd all be taking then, <laughs> Right. I'd be like, oh, gee, two and a half looked good. Now it's at right. zero. But that being said, you might have the ability to refinance at zero as well. Um, let's just hope that they don't get to zero because we have bigger problems if they ever, ever do. If they, if they do. <laughs> okay. Um, and then actually, just to put a finer point on it, how often, I mean, can you just refinance endlessly? I mean, I'm guessing you don't want to be refinancing every other month, every time you see it, it move a little bit. So is there a rule of thumb there about how long to wait? Yeah. So again, I, I, my personal rule of thumb is 0. 0.75 to 1% reduction. I think it's worth it. Okay. Um, so if you just recently refinanced, you're probably going to have to wait a while right. until you're able to like really refinance. Again, assuming interest rates get in like the one range or below one. Okay. Um, this is kind of a fun one, maybe not fun, but maybe more colorful. Any things that you have seen people do during a pandemic in terms of spending that is a definite don't and then a definite do. Um, things that you have seen clients do that you've been like, that is so smart and things that you've you know, heard clients do that you've had to say, no, 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 please don't, don't do this. Do's and don'ts. I've seen some people that have you know, more, more people actually have reached out to do a financial plan. I think it last summer, fall and winter than I've ever experienced, especially in the month of December when most people I'm kind of the last person they want to talk to because <laughs> they're, you know, spending and holidays and stuff. Right. So I've seen people that are actually completely reinventing themselves. Maybe they got laid off mm -hmm. and they're looking at the way things are now. And they're thinking like, okay, I'm, I, I'm not done working but I really love this. I have one client that wants to be an artist. And so we're kind of working in this job that's paying the bills for now with the plan of in seven years, fully focusing on art. It, you can really use this time to reflect. We can't go anywhere. There's not a ton of distractions. Right. And so I think you really could get very clear on what you actually really don't miss. And mm -hmm. that can go. And then the things that you do miss, maybe you want that dream trip or that family reunion. And you can plan ahead for that and really make sure that those things don't get, you know, oh, we'll do it someday. You know, I think there's gonna be maybe some, some people who are really thinking about doing those dream trips or those, you know, those things that they've always wanted to get accomplished. They're looking to do those sooner rather than later because we're all seeing that we don't know how much time any of that. Right. And so um, I think that's something that I've seen that I've really enjoyed those conversations. And then there's some people that are just like, oh, I just, I'm spending money like, crazy because I'm bored, I'm depressed, I'm lonely, I, you know, and then I think it's just kind of figuring out where, you know, if they have a, what does it even matter? I'm already in debt. If it's that kind of mindset, then those are some of the don'ts that I'm seeing that really need to be, um, maybe there's some other underlying issues that are causing you to, to buffer or to, to act in that way. Um, and maybe do more of the habits that you don't want to keep. Well, Misty, I remember we had this conversation when I interviewed you for an article and you had a really good strategy for those of us. And I think there are many of us who are prowling late at night on Amazon and putting mm -hmm. random things into your cart that you would never buy in normal times. What is your technique for kind of stopping? Yeah. Those, those so books? like right now, like I feel bad. My children are, are home. They're bored. They want to be with their friends and doing other things. And so it's like I can buy them a new game or a new something every single day. Um, so typically when I do scroll, I don't buy things that day. I don't save my credit card information to do one click shopping. Oh, I have to get up off the couch <laughs> to get my credit card, which is usually enough for me to be like, they don't, nah, no. <laughs> don't need it that badly. <laughs> be sort of spaced in between you and that purchase. And if you decide, okay, I will go through my cart on payday. And if there's stuff in there that I still want, maybe I'll get it. There's gonna be plenty of things that you just, you just delete because it was just because you felt a certain way, yeah. um, not because you needed it. Are there any other common pitfalls that you've seen, Gerald, with your clients that you would warn people against, especially now during a pandemic? Yes. Well, you know, unfortunately, this pandemic certainly has wrecked havoc on the mental health of a lot of individuals, sadly. 
And one of the things that we know about money is money temporarily can soothe uh, any type of um, you know, health crisis, particularly mental health crisis. But I emphasize the temporarily because once those uh, bills start to come in at the end of the month, or even if you paid for things cash and you start looking at your account balances and recognize that the materialistic items don't necessarily uh, soothe you or you know, make you happy. So, so I would certainly be wary of making um, impulse purchases. You know, certainly something that, you know, unfortunately many people fall into that trap, but you wanna be mindful of it, uh, particularly if you don't have the extra resources to do so. Um, that you know, $1,000 item could have actually gone into a retirement savings whereby 20 years from now, that thousand dollars could be worth five or six thousand dollars. So you know, it's important to think about those. I would say things when you're making large purchases. Okay. Um, what about budgeting? So you know, you hear everybody should have a budget. It's helpful to know where your money goes. I think that a lot of people stare down a stack of bills on their kitchen counter, and it's just overwhelming, and you just shove them into a drawer. Or you only look at them once a month. Do you have budgeting software you recommend, techniques you recommend to really get a solid sense of where that money goes each month? What do you guys like? And either yeah, so it's different. Um, when I do a financial plan, we we do have a budgeting software component to the planning that we do, and some of my clients use that to track expenses mm -hmm. at a very granular level because they they do want to make massive changes or they're really, you know, it's kind of like when someone decides that they're going to change the way they eat or their lifestyle. At first, you might have to really track every single bite because you're learning how to live that way. And so that's how some of my clients that do want to do that intense budgeting can um, get, a, get a handle of it. We can compare month to last month to last year and see if we're making progress. Um, but for some people that feel like they're in a good space, they might have a budget in their mind, then you can look at some of the categories and you can see, you know, everybody I think should know what their monthly expenses look like, know what's coming in, know what interest rates they've got. And these are things you could do in a single day to really just kind of get organized and say like, where, where should we start? You know, and then there are tools available. If you want to do that very specific, I think you need a budget. There might be a fee associated to that app, but it works. Yeah. I mean, and then, you know, there's others like spreadsheets, Google sheets, um, you know, calculators and calendars that you could use. Your bank might have some free calculators and software online that you can kind of go use and see, is, you know, see if you're on track and, and take advantage of those free tools if you need it to. Mm -hmm. What about you, Gerald? Is there an app that you use or software that you like for people that you recommend? Well, we use a proprietary software in the office. Uh, so in terms of apps, I do know the internet, there's uh, a ton of good, resources that are, are free, as Ms. D had mentioned. Yeah. Uh, inside the office, you know, th there's more proprietary software that we use from a budgeting perspective. Okay, um, but is there ever, you know, one thing that it's funny, I saw this tweet the other day and it made me laugh. It was something like, you know, I, it, I would be a millionaire if only I didn't drink a latte every day or something like that. I think there's a book that came out a few years ago that's like, just save $5 a day and you'll be a millionaire by 50. Um, if you are looking for just little ways to cut back, um, what do you what do you recommend? I know that like if you go to the grocery store, you can round up and it will save, put money into a savings account. Are there little tricks and hacks that you like that could really make a big dent in people's budget without feeling like a huge lifestyle and position? Yeah. And I think that, you know, the latte factor that you mentioned, I happen right. to enjoy my coffee. And then right. if I cut that, I would say, I'm not going to do yeah. this anymore because it's not, right. but I think it is important. If you do look at everything you're spending, you're going to find some things that you don't care about. Maybe you donate money to a gym that you never go to, mm. but you're doing it because you feel like you should stop, yeah. stop right. doing that, move that money somewhere else have a budget for the things that you really care about. If you love to travel and never watch TV, let's look at that cable bill. If you stay home and you don't want to travel, like start to, you know, be very clear on the things you care about and don't. And this is a good time to do it because there might be some things that you cannot wait to get back to doing. You might not wait to get to the airport, back to the gym, back to some of those places. Have a space for those in your budget and then merciless, mercilessly go through the rest and get rid of the stuff that isn't important. One thing that I think people might think of as superfluous, but other people might 
consider very important is charity and philanthropy. Mm -hmm. And people really want to, especially right now, give back. Um, although it might be tough, you know, some people who want to give back might maybe truly not be in a position to. Um, at what point is it, quote unquote, financially safe to start donating your money? When do you know you're secure enough to give some of your money away? And how do you prioritize that, Gerald? I, I think it, there is no number. Because um, a, uh, a lot of charitable contributions uh, are, are associated with uh, lifestyle in many cases. And if you find yourself in a position whereby you earn $25,000, but you're living within your means and you have extra to give to charity, mm. then you know, I would definitely advocate it. Um, again, um, I think most charities will accept the donation regardless of what your income is. <laughs> right. The question <laughs> is, should you do it? Yeah, they, they don't ask, oh, you make too much or you make too little income. We can't take your contribution. Uh, so the truth of the matter is definitely the pandemic has hit many charities hard. And, you know, again, you want to go back to your personal lifestyle and what your available discretionary income is. And assuming that that's something that you want to incorporate in your life in terms of making charitable contributions, so long as you're able to afford it, that's key. If you can afford it, then I would definitely advocate considering it. Is it ever a good tax strategy? Absolutely. Uh, depending on the charity, you can get, I would say, charitable deductions from 20%, 30%, and up as high as 50%. 50% uh, generally is not something that most people can attain. There's mm. the rules that you have to look at in terms of qualified as opposed to non-qualified charitable contributions. But making co charitable contributions is a great tax strategy. Is there a way, somebody else asked this in the Q&A earlier, actually, um, any good websites to investigate the, the soundness, the financial soundness of a charity, its reputation and so forth? Are there certain sites that you like? There are. I believe that there are ways. And I would definitely, um, I, I, I'm trying to think of the, the name, but I think you can see how much, what a charity actually does with their money. I do think that there's right, websites right, right. that will show you how much actually goes to the charity, how much goes to the board or other things that you might not be considered. So I would definitely yeah do a, a quick search of that. It should be easy to come up because I know, I, I know that the I've seen those before, and I'd say for people who don't have money to maybe they feel like they can't give to charity because they need to borrow from somewhere else or they're they're living um, at a you know at a stressful time, write a good review, share their messages, share all of the stuff that they're putting out there. If you see it on social media, get their voice, amplify it. That's free. You That's can do great. that in your spare time. And those reviews that like small business owners get, that's, that means so much to the people that are trying to keep their doors open, that are trying to attract new people. People are going in line and looking and seeing who's open. And if you're out there saying, this is the best, you know, I love this place. Um, I love what these people are doing. I love what this charity does. I love their message. Right. Donate your time, donate your energy. And then when you can do your money, then you, then you go back to doing that. That's such a good tip. And you know, speaking of tips, even leaving, you know, an Uber driver or a DoorDash or, you know, a delivery person, a tip or something like that yeah. is a good way to just do, do what you can, but you know, face to face. yep. All right. We have time for a couple of audience questions. So I'm going to pull up and see that we've gotten a lot of good ones that are coming in. Um, so hold on a second. These are going to be unexpected, but I know that you can field them. Uh, how do I find, this is a good question. How do you find the right financial advisor? How do you know who you click with? How do you go about finding somebody? Obviously both of you come highly recommended. Um, but how, you know, how do you know it's, I, I guess it's like finding the right doctor or the right other, you know, in any profession, is it about chemistry? Is it about what? Absolutely. Um, I think finding the right financial advisor is kind of like, I would say, meeting a life partner. Um, you know, you might actually, I would say, have a few dates and then you realize, okay, this is the person for me. Uh, there's some great websites too. Uh, Misty and I are both certified financial planners. So there's resources at the CFP board whereby you can go to their website, put your area code in, and it will give you a list of certified financial planners in your area. It also provides a description about the advisor. So you can kind of look online, but you truly want to have a conversation, talk about your goals, your objectives, and see if there's a good fit between what the advisor does and what you're looking to accomplish. Uh, the FPA of Massachusetts also has a similar site whereby you can find an advisor as well. So those are two great resources that I would recommend. 
Yeah, I think everyone is different. You know, you might click with somebody, you want to make sure that that person is listening to you and your goals. If you're saying like, I really want to put my kids through college. And then the advisor just says, we're not going to do that. You have to do this. Make sure you're actually being heard because this is a long relationship. You have to be real honest about what things look like. And you're going to want to make sure that you're with somebody that doesn't have necessarily their own agenda, their own products and things that they can sell. And that's why what Gerald mentioned about, you know, going to the CFP board, Gerald, we have to act in our client's best interest. We, that, the- those are belong above our own. Somebody had asked this, um, not today, but I've been asked this previously. What is the difference between a fee-based and a commission-based financial planner? Um, okay. Is, yeah. What is that? Yeah. So um, a fee, a fee only, or a fee only, or a fee-based person. So I either make a flat fee for a financial plan, or somebody will pay a fee from the assets that I manage. Part of that money will then pay for the planning and investing services. Somebody who works on commission earns money when they sell a product. Um, And so that could be life insurance, variable annuities, things like that, where they make money by product sales. So if somebody wants to talk about investing in their 401k, they might be trying to direct it towards buying the product that they sell, which makes money. So that's why I think that conflict of interest is hard to ignore. I think insurance has a huge place in a financial plan. But I think if you have somebody that, you know, is just making commissions, then it's kind of like having fewer tools in the toolkit (laughs) and they want to make sure that, you know, they can maybe put that product on you. We have to make sure what you sell you fits perfect and looks good. It's not just something you could buy and and leave. Okay. Got it. We have about three minutes left. And so I want to leave people with some actionable advice before they go. So if you both could just reflect on something that people could do as soon as they log off, you know, something you can do today, something maybe you could do within the week and maybe something a little longer term within the next few months for people who are, you know, wanting to really set a plan plan in place. Where do we go from here, Gerald? I, I would start by creating a solid budget. There are no restrictions on why people cannot start working on a solid budget. Um, If we go out a little further, certainly working toward building an emergency fund, Mm -hmm. extremely important. And uh, another thing that you can do, as we talked about uh, using, I would say, uh, resources when you're buying um, different items is not to overextend yourself. Mm -hmm. And, And the very last thing I would say is actually, you know, Use your credit wisely. I advocate that people like check their credit periodically by going to the three major credit uh, bureaus, TransUnion, Experience, and Equifax. Just, just looking at your credit, um, making sure that you know, everything looks good. Unfortunately, we live in a world whereby you know, there are cyber hacks and, and credit fraud and you know, even I was, I was victimized from a, a space of, no. I, I received a, a letter from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts stating that Gerald Lofton was applying for unemployment benefits. And I'm like, well, that's not possible if I'm working every day. So, so needless to say, there, there are scams out there. So you definitely want to be on top of like your credit, making sure that you're not a victim of credit fraud as well. So, so those are the four things that I think you can implement in a very short period of time. That's- that's great. Anything to add, Misty? Before yeah, I would say I think that those are excellent points, knowing your numbers and getting organized. I would say some things that somebody could do today is really start to think about their, them in the future. Where do they want to be after this is all over? After when things maybe get back to normal, maybe, um, you know, down the road, what, is, what do they really want? Mm-hmm. And I would start, you know, you can spend a day just kind of thinking about certain things that you really, you know, those goals, those bigger things that you want to start working on. And then back into it, how would that person 10 years from now who was able to retire comfortably, how did she get there? What did she maybe do? And then start those lists of things that you need to start knocking off the, you know, and and get them scheduled and done. If you can, in a week, in a month, you can start listening to different things. If you're only watching the news and you're seeing things that are scary and, and horrible and depressing, you can start listening to people that turn their lives around. The people that went from, you know, getting their credit card declined to starting a thriving business and just start listening and trying to change the channel on certain things. So you feel like you have that 
positive message in that inspiration where you can then go ahead and become that person. So I think you look at a goal back into it, figure out some steps and some things that you can work on now, and then you just get started. This is hopeful. Thank you so, so much. Each of you, we covered so much ground. Uh, Misty Lynch from Beck Bode and Gerald Lofton from Proficient Wealth Counselors. You guys were fantastic and made me feel better. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kara. And uh, again, big thank you to, to Misty and Gerald uh, for a really, really informative dialogue here today. I mean, I loved the emphasis on the emergency fund, uh, obviously, and, and I loved the tip on using surpluses that you get to maybe help jumpstart that. Uh, it was those were both really, really helpful amongst a host of tips. And, and honestly, Gerald, from what we're seeing with fraud uh, impacting a lot of our customers, the tips on making sure you got your credit bureau in order and you're watching for some of those fraudsters are, are really important tips for people to be uh, keeping an eye on. So I hope everyone took great notes of all the wonderful things you heard. And I wish everyone well here today and really thank you uh, for allowing Envision Bank to be part of this conversation. So thank you everyone and have a great day. Thank you all. It's great to chat with you. Take care. Bye.